Good evening, and welcome to Time's 2016 election night coverage. I'm joined tonight by Nancy Gibbs, Time Magazine's managing editor, and Alan Murray, Time Inc.'s chief content officer. So, thank you both for joining us tonight. Uh, and on the, at the very end of this historic election, let's take a look back. Nancy, um, what was different about this race in comparison to uh, all others that have preceded it? Uh, well, on the one hand, nothing. If you think about how a year ago this time, if you look at where Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton stood in their approval ratings, the number is almost exactly the same today. So you could say that we rode this incredible roller coaster all year and nothing ended up changing. On the other hand, absolutely everything felt different. It's hard to even list all of the things that we had never seen before. It wasn't just that we had the first female nominee. We had literally the most experienced nominee on the one hand, someone who has already lived in the White House for eight years, never happened before, running against the furthest outside of all outsiders. You have the last two baby boomers uh, that we're likely to see running against each other. You have um, a the two most unpopular candidate. So it isn't just that one party nominated someone who is historically unpopular. The other party did, too, in the same year. There are so many coincidences, so many sort of mind-blowing anomalies about this race that you have to start to think that, that there was something going on that didn't have to do with these two candidates about the body politic that we are going to be studying and thinking about for years to come. What do you think I, that was? I, I, I will look. First of all, the other thing you have to—I agree with everything Nancy said. The other thing you have to point out is just the vitriol, the anger. I mean, these candidates weren't just saying I'm the better candidate. They're, they're, they were saying she should be in jail. He's a sexual offender, unfit for office. Was was and and we haven't seen that. Uh, uh, people kind of forget that, but there's always been sort of a a limit on how negative candidates would go because they knew if they went negative, they were also going to drive themselves down. And in this one, it was a race to the bottom. Let's see. I got to make sure his unfavorables go uh, go up faster than my unfavorables do. You and know, yet, it was a... And yet, how do we explain? Because I think that's true. And yet, this was also the most watched, most followed, most obsessed over campaign I have ever seen. And partly it's because technology makes it possible for people to follow every tweet and twitch in a race every second of the day. But last August, you had 24 million people tuning in to a Republican primary debate, which is unheard of. We were talking about this earlier. I mean, one of the great ironies of this is that Donald Trump said, the, the media is against me. The media worked against me. My goodness, no one has ever played the media as expertly as he has. You know, if the media is against you in Russia or China, you don't get on the air. Right. Donald Trump right. didn't get off the air right. for a year. And it worked as a strategy during the primary. In the general, obviously, it turned against him. It's I mean, again, so many of the things that we thought mattered turned out not to matter this year, particularly in the Republican Party. He, he, this was, you know, the disintermediated campaign. The party leaders were not behind him. That didn't matter. A lot of the party money was not behind him. That didn't matter. He, the. The press certainly was writing serial obituaries about, well, he can't possibly survive saying John McCain's not a war hero. He can't possibly survive the Muslim ban. He could, every single moment where his, this was meant to be the fatal blow to his own campaign. I mean, the night of the South Carolina primary, he's, he's defending Planned Parenthood and saying that George Bush lied the country into war in South Carolina. Well, he can't possibly survive that, and then he goes on to win. So over and over again, the fact that he could win the nomination, having spent less than anyone because all the media was free, done it without any of the party behind him, uh, just shows that party, although arguably both parties, found themselves in completely foreign territory this time around. <laughs> well, but, yeah, let's, let's start with Republicans. I mean, what did we learn about the party? This is a party that, after 2012, um, counseled, in effect, a move to the middle. Uh, moderating its messaging to appeal to Hispanics, trying to broaden its base. Donald Trump did away with virtually every uh, oh, recommendation. He, he, he learned, he didn't, that's right, he rejected all the lessons that we supposedly learned four years ago. He recreated the Republican Party. It's a completely different uh, party than it was. I mean, remember, it's not that long ago that the Democratic Party was the party of the working man and the Republican Party was the party of educated elites. And of course, what we saw in this election was the exact opposite. So very, very different dynamics. 
Um, but the one thing, and this goes back to the question you asked earlier that I think it's important to get at here, is it, it does say something very important about the American public. There is a large group of the public that is deeply dissatisfied both with the economic system and with the political system. They feel it, neither of those things are working for them. And that's something that the next president is going to have to spend some serious time figuring out how to address. Given sort of all the, uh, you know, the, these new, um, uh, the norms that Trump shattered, is this an aberration as an election? Or is, do we think it's the beginning of a new trend uh, of sort of having a conquering outsider come in, um, break all the China, steal the party's identity in the process? I'm not sure that is the trend. It, it is, it's easy to argue that he was sui generis, that he, you know, this figure who had been a household name, he had been, you know, present in people's living rooms long before. Um, and so the idea that there are other outsiders who have the combination of his celebrity and his money and his willingness to do this, that's a little harder to believe. But the, what, I, what I do think this is the beginning of is the, the, the message and the alliances and the coalitions of the Republican Party in particular have been so completely disrupted that the party is going to have to take a very hard look on its position on trade and on foreign intervention and on immigration and on um, core issues where he departed over and over and over again from traditional Republican orthodoxy. Yeah. And I don't think that goes away. And, and look, in some sense, this is not the beginning of the trend. It's the, the end of a very long trend. I mean, I, I first got to Washington 35 years ago and feel like I've watched uh, our political system deteriorate for three and a half decades. The, the ability of people of goodwill from both parties to sit down and do things in the interest of the country has just uh, 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 been pulled apart as the parties have retreated further and further into separate camps. And so even though Trump was a very different kind of candidate and appealed to some very different disaffected people, you did have the sort of uh, uh, taken to the extreme, this polarization that has, has torn the country apart. And frankly, it's going to make it very difficult to get the country put back together again and on a on a coherent path. What can the party do, what can sort of the party elites on both sides do uh, to restore order, as it were, sort of to, to let those sort of centripetal forces kick in again? I think if they're looking to restore order, that is, then they will be, have missed the message that I think voters on both sides were trying to send loud and clear. I mean, the, Alan's exactly right. The, the level of, of disenchantment with the way the political system is working, you hear from people at every income level, at, in every geographical region, the, the sense that there is this tremendous disconnect between people in power and the rest of the country. And so if, if whatever unfolds, if there's a notion that, okay, we can just go back to the way we were doing things before, I just, that seems to me to be a, a fatal misreading. And the optimistic scenario, it may not be the likely scenario, but the optimistic scenario is that the lesson is, okay, we've we've got to find a different way uh, to make this thing work. I mean, we've had dysfunctional government for the last five years, at least. Uh, and, and if politicians don't come out of this experience recognizing that that just isn't sitting well with the American public, uh, I don't know what's going to get the message across. You know, Donald Trump can talk about making America great again. America is pretty great. You know, there's a lot of awfully good stuff going on right now. And, and uh, it's just uh, uh, the political, s well, it's two things. One is there are a fair number of people who have been left behind, and we have to figure out a way to bring them along better than we have for the last two decades. And two, the political system is broken. And, and, and there are things that need to be done, and, and the next president is going to have to figure out a way to make that work. It's not going to be easy. Well, I think it's a, a fair assessment and the right optic, optimistic note to wrap up on.